Lines of emaciated, ragged-looking Soviet men sit down for their evening meal of potato and turnip soup at the notorious Buchenwald concentration camp. Some of them are already dying from starvation and so are marked out for execution. These are the so-called Musel Manor. But on this day, the Nazis have something else on the menu, something as grotesque and heartless as anything in the annals of human depravity. As Nazi officers and doctors stand in the distance, their clipboards and pens clasp in their hands. One by one, four prisoners drop to the floor. What kind of wicked experiment is this, think the other prisoners, shaking their heads and dreaming of revenge. It's possible some of them would have heard rumors about the human experimentation in the camps. The fact that some people went to see the doctor and either came back in agony with sometimes serious injuries or didn't come back at all. Thousands of prisoners at these camps became guinea pigs for Nazi physicians, whose abject lack of medical ethics would one day lead to the development of the Nuremberg Code. Today we'll focus on a few kinds of experiments that have happened at Buchenwald and tell you why they happened and the horrors the Americans saw when they liberated the camp on April 11, 1945. First of all, we mentioned something that you might not be familiar with, Muselmanner. The singular form of the word is Muselman. While it might sound similar to muscle man, it was exactly the opposite. It was a word designated for prisoners who were so starved, so weak, so lost in apathy and meaning that they were unable to stand, never mind work. There are varying theories as to where the word came from, but it almost certainly has its basis in the word Muslim. A Muslim meant Muslim man, which may have been related to the Muslim practice of sujood, when Muslims prostrate themselves in prayer. The prisoners, their muscles atrophied, might have been bent over like this through sheer lack of energy. Another theory coming from Buchenwald says it relates to Islamic fatalism, meaning the men were resigned to thinking they could not do anything about their future. In any case, when prisoners started looking like this, it usually wasn't long until they were sent to the gas chamber, or shot, or became victims of some cruel experiment. It's the latter that interests us today. We also mentioned Soviet men, men who, like the Jews, were deemed as subhuman by the Nazis. They were treated with the utmost disrespect and hated by the Nazis, said to be a wart on the earth that needed to be eliminated. So, if they showed the slightest sign they were about to become unable to serve as a laborer, the Nazis wouldn't think twice about executing them. The Germans were involved in a war of annihilation against the Soviet Union, and as Aryans they thought it was their right to relieve the world of what they said were subhuman Slavs. Soviet prisoners of war, some 5.3 million of them throughout World War II, were fair game for torture and death according to Nazi ideology. It's believed about 3.3 million Soviet POWs died throughout the war while in Nazi custody, although the exact number of how many died in the camps is unknown. At well over a 50% death rate, the number is startling when we compare it to the deaths of British and American POWs held by the Nazis. Of 231,000 Brits and Americans, about 8,300 or 3.6% died at the hands of the German captors. Since the Nazis came to power and up until their fast downfall, they operated over a thousand concentration camps, known as Konzentrationslager, in Germany and all over German-occupied Europe. These were often split into subcamps, such as Mauthausen, often called a Russian camp, which had about 100 subcamps. Actually, the camps, including Mauthausen, held all kinds of prisoners. They held millions of Jews and Soviets, but also other groups of people, including homosexuals, Roma people, German anarchists, Czechoslovak socialists, Polish Boy Scouts, Jehovah's Witnesses, and just about anyone the Nazis deemed a threat. The camp we'll discuss in detail today also held regular German criminals who became a part of the medical experiments. One of the main motives behind the construction of this concentration camp network was to make money by using prisoners as slave labor. Well-known German companies such as the pharmaceutical giant Bayer made good use of these camps, as did companies working in heavy industries. At Mauthausen, many prisoners died of exhaustion and starvation working in the stone quarry, which prisoners said began with the stairs of death. One of the prisoners who survived later said, if you stopped for a moment, the SS either shot you or pushed you off the cliff to your death. But Mauthausen didn't have a gas chamber, so it wasn't what we'd call an extermination camp per se. The prisoners were there to work, and work they did although their life expectancy was but a few months. While there were six main extermination camps with gas chambers, Chelmano, Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, Maidanek, and Auschwitz-Birkenau, at the concentration camps people often didn't last long either, and were also exterminated when they were no longer useful. Many Soviets died in the labor camps, while as much as 90% of the 6 million Jews the Nazis murdered died at the extermination camps. Let's now talk about the Buchenwald concentration camp. 
Opened in July 1937, it was one of the first large-scale concentration camps, and its unlucky occupants at the start were communists or suspected communists. During the war, it also got an influx of Poles, Slavs, Jews, Roma people, mentally ill, disabled, homosexual, and political prisoners who all lived and worked at the camp. It was notorious for its terrible conditions and lack of food, which is one reason, on top of the summary executions, why around 60,000 of the 280,000 prisoners died there or at one of its 139 subcamps. There was just one set of barracks set aside for the 500 to 1,000 women that were sent to Buchenwald, some of whom were forced to work as Nazi sex slaves. Buchenwald was partly a brothel, but as we said, the main reason for its existence was so private German companies could pay the SS peanuts and get the prisoners working for them, work often related in some way to armament production. It was a rare thing during the war for Western POWs to end up in Nazi concentration camps. They almost always went to one of Germany's 1,000 POW camps. The two should not be mixed up. One was hell on earth. The others had rules about food rations, labor, and how much rest a prisoner should get. Conditions were sometimes tough, but the Germans usually adhered to the Geneva Convention that they had signed in 1929. Even when 169 Allied airmen ended up at Buchenwald, an unusual occurrence, only two of the airmen from the list, mostly American, British, and Canadian soldiers, perished during the three months they were there. Still, one of them who died only in 2021, retired 2nd Lieutenant Russell Hilding, said they all endured hunger, thirst, and beatings. Even so, none of them were even close to becoming Muslimaner. For the Germans, the Soviets were a completely different breed. There were no rules, quite literally where treatment of Soviet POWs was concerned. The camp also had a fairly large homosexual population. Homosexuality was a crime in Germany at the time under paragraph 175 of the law, which was amended under the Nazis to say homosexual love inclines people toward plague-like propagation. About 7,000 men were convicted of homosexuality under the Nazis, after which they either agreed to have their God-given sexuality re-educated out of them, or they ended up being sent to the front line or to camps. One of these camps was Buchenwald. In 1943, the so-called architect of the Holocaust, Heinrich Himmler, issued an order stating that all incorrigible homosexual offenders should be sent to the camps. When they got to Buchenwald, they sometimes ended up visiting part of the camp with the fancy title, the Division for Typhus and Virus Research of the Hygiene Institute of the Waffen-SS. This is where they were, as the name suggests, purposefully infected with typhus and other viruses. The barracks, Block 46, looked like a hospital block and was cut off with barbed wire from the rest of the camp. The person in charge was a chief physician who worked under the German bacteriologist and the chief of hygiene institute of the Waffen-SS, Joachim Murgolgowski. Typhus was just one disease that prisoners were infected with. At Buchenwald, the Nazis also tested vaccines for other infectious diseases such as erysipelas, a skin infection, scarlet fever, or paratyphoid diarrhea. The pharmaceutical companies worked in tandem with the Nazis and their war effort, as getting ahead in vaccine technology could potentially save the lives of a lot of men on the front lines. As well as being poisoned, we'll talk more about that soon, homosexuals, Soviets, criminals, and political prisoners were all infected with diseases so the Nazis could test experimental vaccines. A breach of the Nuremberg Code, if of course there was a Nuremberg Code at the time. As we said, it was created because of such experiments. The strange thing about Block 46 was that when prisoners were sent there, they first thought they'd gotten lucky. Inside, there were four large rooms, which had spotless floors, and the beds they were provided were actual beds rather than bunks, all contained in what was a very modern clinic. The prisoners arrived there after living in absolute squalor. In the journal of a survivor named Robert Waits, he wrote, the bed linen was clean and had pretty coverlets and pillowcases in a blue and white check pattern. He said it was so quiet it reminded him of a monastery. The nurses were nice enough and the staff, actual prisoners, were happy as the job provided them numerous perks. He wrote, the meals served in this barrack were bigger and more varied, compared with the standard camp rations. Milk, half a liter per patient, butter, 50 grams, white bread, an egg, marmalade or artificial honey, sugar, sweetened porridge, semolina or a milk noodle soup. Wow, jackpot! The prisoners thought they were onto a winner. Little did they know they were about to get a shot of typhus, although it must be said that some of them already had typhus. According to Waits' report, some even volunteered, knowing that if they survived, they'd live for three months in relative luxury. The incorrigible criminals, Russians, homosexuals, and political prisoners had no choice in the matter. So, Block 46 was a hospital both for patients who had caught typhus in the natural way 
and a station for research on human subjects with experimentally induced typhus. Either way, they were in trouble. Their life was now in the hands of a Dr. Erwin Ding Schuler, who was the head doctor at the camp and the main man at the Hygiene Institute who, you'll remember, worked for Murugowski. From January 1942 to March 1945, Ding Schuler led the program for nine series of tests with possible typhus vaccines developed at the camp. 988 prisoners all took part, one quarter died, with the rest becoming seriously injured. Here's what one report stated regarding just one experiment with typhus. Nine out of the ten prisoners injected intravenously died. Only one of the four injected subcutaneously died. The most common cause of death was encephalitis or cardiovascular collapse. Working under Ding Schuler was the camp doctor, Valdemar Hoven, and the head prisoner nurse at the typhus ward, prison trustee Arthur Dietsch, as well as Ding Schuler's medical clerk, the camp survivor and future historian Eugen Kogan. It was one big, unhappy family. And it's thanks to Kogan, who'd been arrested by the Gestapo in Germany in 1936 for working for anti-National Socialist forces, that we know a lot about what happened in the camp. He said he saw many prisoners die from the experiments, but also said that he saw Ding Schuler actually save prisoners' lives at times. Kogan saved a few men, too, by swapping their names for guys who'd already passed away from typhus. Both he and Dietsch later found out that the Nazis planned to exterminate them both when the experiments ended. The prisoners faced a lot more challenges than just disease, though. The Buchenwald experiments were also part of the Nazis' chemical warfare program. We now know the pharmaceutical companies paid the SS to test two neurotoxic substances, the nerve agents Tobin and Sarin. Poisons of the alkaloid group were also tested and given to at least four Soviet soldiers in order to see their reaction. When the doctor's trials took place after the war, one person testified that when the poisons proved not to be fatal, the men were strangled and taken to the crematorium and dissected. The same trial revealed that some men were given serious phosphorus burns so the doctors could treat them with experimental balms. They did this to test how to treat those injuries on the battlefield. Let's get back to the star of today's show, poison. At the beginning, some types of poison were secretly mixed into the prisoners' food. It was said in the trials that they died instantly, after which their bodies were taken for autopsy, where valuable information could be learned. It was also said that in September 1944, some test subjects at Buchenwald were shot with poisoned bullets, but we can't find much information about this other than people testified that it happened. On Wednesday, the 18th of April 1945, The Guardian in the UK wrote, Escorted by American military police, a thousand of the citizens of the Weimar marched six miles through lovely country to the Buchenwald concentration camp yesterday. This was part of the early denazification process to show the German people what the Nazis had done in those camps. Many cried, some puked, and some fainted when they saw the horrors in front of them. When the Americans liberated the camp, they found what the Guardian said were blackened frames of bodies still in the ovens and two piles of emaciated dead in the yard outside. Through huts where living skeletons, too ill or weak to rise, lay packed in three-tier bunks. Men in the camp were still dying at a rate of about 40 a day. The Guardian wrote, Doctors say this one will die today, that one tomorrow, and others may have a month to live. Such is Nazism. In all, an estimated 56,545 died at the camp, most from diseases and starvation, but over 8,000 were shot in the head. 1,000 were hanged, and hundreds died from the medical experiments. The survivors had lived so long on thin barley, potato, or turnip soup that it was dangerous for the Americans to give their emaciated bodies anything more than 300 grams of bread a day. Their stomachs had to slowly adapt to their new diet for several days after they were liberated. One of the Americans later remembered what happened when he had at first unknowingly given them evidently too much food. He wrote that a few of them devoured the items and then passed out and died on the spot. Another wrote, the lesson was learned quickly. Feeding starving people in a spirit of compassion is a task that requires patience. It was such an awful sight, something that traumatized many of the American soldiers. A 23-year-old army sergeant wrote home to his sister the next day, saying, I was there yesterday, and I still can't get the sight of those poor souls out of my mind. At least 70 of those U.S. soldiers donated their blood to those helpless people who were so sick they needed transfusions. One of the U.S. medics wrote, The mental disturbance of the inmates was very apparent. It took anywhere from a week to three weeks for most of the inmates to realize the significance of the fact that they were now among friends and Americans who had liberated the camp. Another said he lived with it all his life, saying that after that day, the only thing that vanished was our innocence. But what happened to the doctors of the Buchenwald camp who were partly responsible for all the sorrow and pain? 
Gerhard Rose, a tropical medicine doctor who took part in the typhus experiments, said at trial he understood that the prisoners were going to be sentenced to death anyway, so what did it matter? In his defense, his lawyer argued that American doctors had experimented on prisoners in Manila because those prisoners had been sentenced to death and one of them died in the experiments. What's the difference, said the lawyer? Rose, he said, was just a legally appointed executioner. But that's where other witnesses, including Kogan, said those prisoners were actually not sentenced to die. Most were merely guinea pigs. Rose was sentenced to life in prison. Like many Nazis, Deng Schuler ensured he was dead before he could be hanged. But other doctors involved with the Buchenwald experiments, including Joachim Murugowski and Voldemar Hoven, ended up swinging by a rope. Now you need to watch why Hitler never had an atomic bomb. Or have a look at what happened immediately after Hitler died.